then time, like it takes over everybody's life when they get that big push, and uh, we lost touch. And then we got back in touch, and then up and down, and then I just heard he was, you know, we had, you know over a disagreement, we'd stopped talking for a while, and it was, you know, it was over something stupid, and I just called him up and said, listen, dude, I want to fix this. And I heard you're not doing so well. And, you know, I, I said, I don't want you to, I, I want to send you something that's helping some people. Let me send it to you. You don't have to do it. Just read about it. You know, just follow some of the food stuff. And then I called my, uh, my buddy, Steve Yu. And we've been doing a, a, a number of projects together all around inspiring people that, to own their lives. And uh, I said, listen, I sent Jake the program. And, um, Yo, let's see what he does with it. And he says to me, you know, you're moving back to Atlanta. What if Jake moved in with you? I said, what? Jake moved in with me, dude. Arthur, you know, he did it at home. Jake don't have to move in with me. <laughs> yeah, but if he's with us, can you imagine all that positive influence? You know, he can't fail. I said, dude, you don't know Jake Roberts. <laughs> and then when we finally got, you know, to, to go down there and film him, uh, and everything was, we, and I told him, I said, I have this idea, and it was all built around Jake leaving the business the way he should have left it, with the dignity, and that was really what it was about. And uh, we went down there, and I said, if you, if you do this, you know, we'll film it all the way through, and if you lose 20 pounds, We'll bring you up to Atlanta. And uh, and that's where Steve took over in the middle of that. Steve, do you want to talk about stepping in as a filmmaker to this project, to this idea? Yeah, what did you yeah. think when he called you and asked you to take this on? I well, mean, you, you'd seen Beyond the Map by that point. I mean, obviously, the Darren Aronofsky wrestler kind of picked up where that left off. I mean, what, uh, what were your thoughts walking into this? Well, it, it was pretty difficult coming in because I was kind of an outsider to this brotherhood. And... You know, the biggest thing for me was to try to get Jake to trust me as someone who he would allow to film. And he, he definitely didn't trust me. In the he didn't trust you at all. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was difficult because he trusted Dallas implicitly. So over time, it, I mean, even to this day, you know, I don't know that he totally trusts me. But I think over time he realized that, you know, we were trying to help him. Because I think he felt like beyond the mat, you know, depicted him... A very negative way so um, you know it was just an amazing thing to have so much access to this like raw experience trying to help Jake so it was really amazing. right uh, Chris can you talk a little bit about uh, how long it took to film uh, the budget where the with financing came from uh, yeah I mean that, that's basically them but um, I can talk about my my role as an executive producer basically um, I saw what they were doing on YouTube and Steve and I had talked on I think like on Facebook or something like that I made a movie called Bigger, Stronger, Faster. He was a fan of it. Yeah. Let's hear it. And um, I, wa I saw this phone call that um, that you guys made to um, to Scott. Yeah, the one that was in. And I was bawling. I was fucking crying so bad watching that because my brother had just died from addiction from right. from a problem like this, you know. And um, it just hit me, man. I I, I was just encouraging Steve like. Like, this has got to be a movie. Why is this just a YouTube clip? This is amazing. And I didn't really know that they were, they were making a movie. So, like, fast forward a, a year later, uh, when, he, when he called me and asked me to be involved in it, I mean, I was 100% in. I mean, it's just such a great project. And I guess you guys can talk about the uh, financing and other stuff. <laughs> well, I just, again, I was trying to pay Jake back. So, I was going to give to him and bring him into my house. And the, the story just unfolded around us. And, like, I had people come up, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin said to me, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> what are you thinking? You got that, you know, that uh, that disabled vet. I mean, he's the story. I go, yeah, dude, but it's someone, you know, Jake helped me so much, and I, you know, it, my company's not going to die if Jake doesn't, you know, we can't do this. You know, it's, you know, I just wanted to put it out there. And, uh, uh, and then when I brought Scott in, <laughs> I got another call from <laughs> <laughs> from the redneck, you're like, what are you thinking? Uh, but, you know, I just felt like I was just pushed in that position, Joey. You know, I, was, I, I felt everything was lining up. I mean, that night, 
I called Scott Hall. If you want to see that call that Chris had seen, it's like 12 minutes. The mastermind of editing all of this, you know, this story is Steve because he told the story in a way that just, you know, connected all the dots. But, you know, that, I called Jake, not Jake, Scott. I called Scott over the last 10 years, for maybe 20, 20 times. He never answered the phone. That night he answered the phone. So, like he said, it was like divine intervention. To a certain degree, I totally believe that. Well, Gene Okerlin mentioned in the movie that you were 35 years old when you became a professional wrestler. Right. What was it about wrestling for you? Well, I tried it when I was a kid. When I was 22, I tried. You know, I tried it. I loved it. I mean, I wanted to be uh, this guy named Hansy Jim Jimmy Valiant. So I, I, my name was Handsome Dallas Page. <laughs> you can tell that gimmick was over. <laughs> um, but uh, it didn't work out for me. And then when I was uh, in a nightclub business, I was running nightclubs, you know, God, since I was 22. And uh, Jake actually came into my club all the time in Fort Myers, Florida. I was buddies with Jake, drinking buddies in my club. So, I mean, he would come by, DiBiase would come by, Nasty Boys, Bushwhackers. I mean, because I was in Fort Myers, they go from Tampa to Miami. Well, <laughs> that's the layover spot. And uh, so I got to, uh, you know, we had that, that whole group already getting to know each other. It was just, I feel like everything's been divine intervention, like I'm just on a path, you know? Sure, well, it seems like, uh, especially in filmmaking, TV, uh, we're getting into this kind of reality period where we're, we're, we're getting behind the curtain uh, of a lot of the, the, the you know, Say, you know, professional wrestling, we grew up in the 80s, we really didn't know what was going on in terms of the lifestyle until recently you saw some of the wrestlers starting to pass away. I mean, this year the Hall of Fame will, will induct uh, posthumously Randy the Macho Man Savage, uh, who was my personal favorite wrestler growing up. What about it? Um, but I think it, it's brought to light or put some awareness on the topics that are, that are taken further in, in this film that were kind of started with Beyond the Mat. Um, can you talk a little bit about the lifestyle of a professional wrestler? Man, there's a couple guys up there who know what it's like. It's, uh, Johnny Morrison, RVD, Edge, I and mean, these guys, they lived it right, you know, same style, doing like, you know, 270 days a year or more in the mat, banging your body on the mat, now drive 100, 200, 300 miles to the next town, Find the hotel, check in, crash out, get up, load your bags, load your car, go eat, go to the gym, go to the building, and then drive 100, 200, 300 miles or fly across country. If we got hurt in the ring, you know, they took care of that. You know, and by that time you had a secured contract, they took care of that too. You know, so you know, there's no one who doesn't know. There's no insurance. <laughs> Every kid coming up with, they don't give a shit. They just want to get in that ring and, and, and entertain, you know, and live the dream. So, uh, you know, maybe if I would have done it in 97 when I was at the top of the world, you know, and I would have went at Warner Brothers had just bought Turner. So it was over that period because they are so, you know, union oriented. That would have been the time. But I was just so consumed with the travel, and I mean, I wish I had someone following me around with a YouTube back then. Well, not really. Uh, <laughs> parts of it. Uh, but just, because I forgot, I forgot two-thirds of it, you know? When you talk about the toll that it takes physically and mentally, um, you know, to hear that, that, that yell, you, you hear Jake talk about putting his hands on the canvas, on the apron again, and that feeling that hearing your music played when you're in the crow's nest, you're about to walk out. Uh, and, and then, of course, that toll that it takes, it seems uh, that we're learning that it takes a toll spiritually. Can you talk about how you keep spiritually centered, how you stay sane on the road and come out of it? I mean, you seem like a really healthy guy. <laughs> in many ways, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I, starting at 35 was brutal on my body, but not on my mind. Because... I mean, I was smart, not a lot smarter, but I was smarter at 35 thinking, like, I just got to make it to 40. 
Because that's all, that was my goal. It wasn't to be world champion, it wasn't any of that. It was to make it to 40 so I could be the next Jesse Ventura. Like, that was my goal. I want to be out there with Flair, with Sting, with Luger, so I can talk about that. Even if they beat me in five minutes, I could still say it. Took them out there for 30, 60 minutes, you know. I was a heel, I could lie. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, so the, the whole spiritual part, like, there are so many times I could watch myself back, especially in my Savage Feud, which, you know, which was the rocket on my career, you know, after what you know, Scott and Kev did for me with the NWO thing. Um, there's so many times I watch myself on TV there and I go, man, I know I was so much pain there. I mean, before I walked out that curtain, I was crippled up. And, you know, before 42, I wasn't doing no DDP yoga. I was just stretching, and it ain't the same thing. I was still stretching, but it wasn't like it connected my whole body. Like, I could still go out there at the Royal Rumble and knock out three diamond cutters at 59 next month. You know? So, stretching helps, but it's not the answer. And it's a thing that goes like a click that goes off in your head and that music gets and you walk through the door and bang, you're out there. And then if you get hurt, and you've seen it from time to time, where you know, oh my God, he's hurt. Like he's really hurt. Well, that means there's a good chance if you feel that pain, like that instant, oh, like when I ruptured my L4 and L5, when I tore my rotator cuff here, when I tore my rotator cuff there, I was like, okay, this is bad. You know, <laughs> Well, speaking of bad bones, you know, I was talking to my buddy Kevin Nash, who is yep. my, my, my co-star in Magic Mike XXL. We were doing international press today, which was very apropos to tonight. Uh, I love the big sexy. Uh, and we were talking, uh, we both agreed that the DDT may be the most famous finishing move of all time. Uh, but he said that he would sure as hell take a DDT before he would take... The Razor's Edge. Can you talk about the worst bump you ever took? Oh, God. Hmm. The worst. I, I just, I, I was never really crazy about taking uh, either the Razor's Edge or the power, you know, the, uh, the this Kevin Nash's you know, power bomb. He thought it was okay because he let you go and you take your own bump. But he's throwing you through the air and you're, you know, it's, it's, it's so, you want to do this to break your fall, but then you'll break your arm. So you got to take it out. The worst bump I ever took was against with Mark Merrow when he was Johnny B. Bad. And we had just eaten four double cheeseburgers <laughs> in North, Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm, I'm green as grass back then. You know, maybe I wrestled a year, year and a half, maybe two years. And he gave me that backdrop and I went up. But I really didn't flip. And I came down on the top of my neck and I thought I broke my neck. My stomach, there goes all those hamburgers again. <laughs> you know, the guys, we all try to take care of each other out there. Uh, but uh, you, you talk about the DDT, which I do think, you know, at the time was the hottest finishing maneuver ever. Um, Until the diamond cut. But, you know, Jake, I, I, this is a story. This was, this was worth more to me. And I was a United States champion at the time. And he called me up and he said, congratulations. <laughs> I said, Jake? Yeah. What'd you say? Congratulations. Congratulations? For what? Reinventing the DDT. <laughs> that was huge, man. That was huge to me. Chris and Steve, can you talk a little bit, uh, were you wrestling fans prior to coming in on this? I know you had worked with uh, with Dallas a bit on, on uh, some of the videos you guys were making for the company. Uh, but, I mean, were you childhood wrestling fans? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, anybody that's seen Bigger, Stronger, Faster News, I grew up on wrestling. We wrestled in the basement. Me and my brothers used to beat the crap out of each other. Dropped <laughs> elbows off the couch. And, you know, we grew up watching wrestling. So just to get to work with these guys was such an honor to me because I've always loved it. And I know all the guys that are out in the, in the crowd as well. They're just every, the, the wrestling world and being around these guys is such a, was such a positive influence on me, you know, for doing this movie. These, these guys were great to be around and very inspirational. Kept me on my diet and everything. Saying your prayers, eating your vitamins. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, Dallas stuff. is great with that. Yeah, yeah. The best. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with wrestling? Um, yeah, I mean, I watched wrestling, you know, mostly in Jake's era with Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan and everything, and then I started watching a little bit with Dallas. But, you know, 
you know, um, Chris was you know a way bigger wrestling fan, so that's that was one of the reasons we brought him in because he had so much knowledge of the industry. And so for me, coming in as a filmmaker, it was kind of a learning curve because I was I didn't know Jake's history, I didn't know Scott's history, you know, as well as as Chris did. So um, you know, I love those guys, but I wasn't as big. Of a fan. All right, well, let's talk about filmmaking then. All right, can you talk a little bit about the Slam Dance experience? Yeah, it, it was amazing. I mean, I mean, I, this was our first, you know, pro our documentary project that we've completed, and to get accepted to Slam Dance is such a huge honor. I mean, you know, right? I do. So um, it's just it was just so amazing to see people react to what we created because we were so close to it. We watched it so many times, and it was funny when we when we screened our first screening at Slam Dance, like we were all like trying not to cry because we've seen it so many times, but we couldn't help it. So like you'll see at the Q&A at Slamdance, we were just like all, like our eyes were all red, we were trying not to cry, but it was just really such a great experience to see people react to what we created. It was awesome. So. We also had a uh, Royal Rumble party at Slamdance, and it was amazing. I mean, we had the one and only probably sober party, and we had like a hundred people. Every 30 rope. seconds a new person gets in through the velvet rope or something? I, it was amazing. I mean, and the great surprise of the whole thing was Steve had told me that Dallas uh, had a sore throat and had to fly somewhere to go to see his doctor, which I kind of believed at the time, because Dallas will do that, you know? And he ends up coming out in the Royal Rumble and everybody just goes nuts. So that was a great, great thing that we had going on there. Yeah, it was an impossible secret to keep. Because someone posted on Facebook, oh, I saw Dallas flying back to Atlanta, so all of our crew was like, why is Dallas going back to Atlanta? So it was like, Man, it makes me angry. Why does everybody always want to know what's in the present before they open it? Come on, you know? Uh, we got this one kid, Dylan, who just won't let it go. <laughs> Dallas, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about, about going Hollywood and what that experience has been like? Oh, uh, well, you know, I came out here. When I left wrestling in 2002, I came out here, and, and he's here tonight. Howard Fine, where are you at, bro? Right there, everybody. Give a clap for Howard Fine. The number one acting coach, The Rock. He uh, bringing uh, uh, Stone Cold a little personal. He, another guy who took me under under his wing here, and uh, make sure we get a picture before you leave. Fine. Uh, also, an, an amazing transformation. Hey, Howard, how much weight did you lose with DDP Yoga, bro? Thirty-five pounds. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> I kept it off for six years now. Um, but I came out here. I didn't want to uh, come out and just go. Okay, I'm a wrestler, which we're all actors. I mean. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but it's predetermined. Uh, knew you knew it. So, keep that on the down low, all right? Um, so I wanted to come out here and, uh, and study. And I went to see how, I went to a bunch, I ordered a bunch of classes, and I ended up at Howard's. And, uh, and uh, they're reading one of their, the texts that they have. Uh, um, uh, Howard Fine's uh, book. What's your book, Howard, again? Fine on acting. There you go. <laughs> plug, plug. Uh, but back then, we're talking about uh, 12 years ago. I grew up ADD and dyslexic. I was reading at third grade level at the age of 30. I read my first book at 31. It took a year. And I was constantly trying to get better and better. And at 12 years ago, I was not ready to read out loud. So I went to see him after class. And I, I, I said, Howard, can I talk to you? He said, sure. And I said, listen, uh, you know, here's, my, here's the deal. I told him. And he went, Dallas, don't worry about that. He said, if you put the work in to wrestling like you did, if you put the work into acting like you did into wrestling, you're going to be fine. And he had known my career because he watched. So that was another cool part. And uh, you know, and I was lucky out here. I got I got a bunch of parts, but I, I realized that it's not like it's not going to be my calling. It's I'm stuff that I'm going to come back to, but sort of like my man Danny Trejo, who's walking out of here, has done about 400 films and had his first lead at. Well, I won't say how old he is. Cause he's a kid, but he's a superstar. Let's hear it for Danny Trejo out there. <laughs> my man. But coming out here to do our first, our first, our first movie, man, our first movie, and we get picked up into the into the slam dance, you know, festival. I mean, it was so funny because we're there up there with Sundance, 
and we got, uh, we got um, Mr. King going, well, it's great to have you here at Sundance. I go, Larry, this is slam dance. <laughs> so I sl body slammed him right there. Uh, you know, at, at, at its core, this is really, uh, you know, a story of, of redemption, and, uh, and, and it deals with addiction uh, and, and alcoholism, and, and Chris, you hinted on it a, a, earlier. Um, you know, if, if you're comfortable with it, can you talk a little bit about uh, how addiction has affected you and how, uh, what you've kind of, I guess, if you came out of this what, project. What these guys it, didn't know when they, when they actually called me to come back and work on the movie, I was in rehab. So after my brother passed away, I just started going the same way. I said, you know what, after he passed away, I'm like, I'll never go out, you know, like, that'll never happen to me. But I had double hip replacement surgery, got hooked on pills, and then it became booze and pills and booze and pills, and we all know how that goes, and it's, it's uh, really dangerous. I actually have a film coming out at Tribeca Film Festival called Prescription Thugs, which is about um, addiction in my family. And it tells that story, so it continues based on the last it's a really important issue to me, and I was so happy that I got to work on this film. It actually helped me stay clean and sober. How, how are things going with you now? Awesome. I'm out of year right now. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then when we started the film, it, it didn't start out being about addiction. We didn't. We didn't really didn't know Jake had all these issues still. Like because we went there, he did. You know, we assumed that he was sober. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, when you heard me say a month, I said, how long, you know, when was the last time we did drugs? Well, beer, so not alcohol. Last time we did coke, crack. And when he said a month, I was, I, we thought he was clean like a year. You know, because that's when he was in his rehab. And I just thought, like, well, that means if he said a month, that means yesterday. <laughs> you know, and that's what it was. I mean, he just wanted to even get off the phone, so he got to get his buzz. And uh, for him to go clean off a of crack and coke was pretty crazy. And what I did in the beginning is, his whole thing is I can drink three beers. So when you see that time where he's got no shoes on, up till that point, he's fine. Hey, your boss, I get those, yeah, I get the three beers, that's all I want. I'm like, hey, sure, bro. Because I'll give you the rope, you know? I'll give you the rope. I'll let you either hold on to the rope or hang yourself. And it didn't take him long, it took him seven days. And Jake is such a amazing manipulator he did it to all of us it's why we love to watch him so much he's such an amazing character but he was never comfortable being a really in smith now scott will tell you the same thing just like he said at the end of that movie never had any problem in the ring it's outside the ring and today i am like you, you heard me say at the end of the movie it's all about the story we tell ourselves and that's the biggest thing that's helped me, helped both, and it's not me, it's me, it's him, it's all of our crew, it's everyone. We all chip in to help both of these guys, because they're not there yet, but they're a lot closer than they were. But I got them to understand that it's the story you tell yourself. And one of the things, that we, we, we didn't play it in this, but that time we're in the ring, what had happened way before this, where I started to make a turn with both of them, I asked them, I said, before you went out, put on your boots and walk through the curtain, were you saying to yourself, oh God, I'm gonna suck. Oh my God, this, I hope I don't screw this up. This could be the worst thing I've ever done, oh my God. Fuck no, you were like, I'm the king of the world, I'm gonna steal the show, I own this place. That's what was going through your head. Well, why don't you do it when you get out of the ring? Because you still do. It's all the story that you tell yourself. I'm a loser. I'm, you know, I, I, I can't do this. My favorite quote ever is, if you say you can or you say you can't, you're right. Did you always said that, Joe? Sure, yeah, I've heard that one. No, but yeah, well, I mean, me, no, 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 you always said it. Oh, you know who said it. I know you get it. Yeah, Because sure. you're sitting there. Who's I know it? you get it. No, you tell me. Henry Ford. But what the fuck did he ever do? <laughs> Come back on. I know you get it. Because you got to say you can. you got to say you already, you're in the toughest business on the planet. Because I thought wrestling was tough. Acting, there's fuck. Everybody thinks they can do it. Because it looks, when it's really done well, it looks effortlessly. Like anyone can do that. Oh, really? <laughs> As you know, not they can't. Well, having 
no experience really with, with Jake or not knowing necessarily the backstory. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you ended up? I mean, are things that you realized uh, about Jake's journey? I mean, were there things in hindsight that you wished you could have gone back and helped Jake with or suggested? You know, I think that if we would have known what we were getting into, we would have never done the project. Because it, it you know, it was like, oh, let's delve into this really tough, like I didn't know about addiction. That Dallas had experience with he knew people that had and my dad, you know, but and that's what Jake reminded me of my dad. So it just unfolded and we documented it and it turned into some amazing comeback story that we, we couldn't have predicted. You know, everything that happened was like serendipitous. Like, you know, Scott coming in was the perfect time because Jake needed a reason to keep going. And Scott would never have come in if Jake hadn't done that well. Yeah. So it was like this strange company, like I couldn't have helped those guys myself, even if I wanted to. It had to be Dallas who had this long history with them. So it was like really this magical story that, you know, we were just so lucky that we were there to film it. So it was cool. Well, I'm, I'm told that I have one more question. So uh, what's next for the film and how, how can the masses uh, see it? Well, I think uh, we're working on some deals right now to get it out on. Uh, hopefully, we're hoping for Showtime and maybe Net and, and Netflix are definitely like really interested. So that's where we're hoping to um, bring the film. If you need any help, Showtime and Netflix are the ones that bought my doc last year. So there we go. <laughs> you can help us. <laughs> we will take your help. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things I, you know, because everything's social media, and a lot of you are on social media. What's our um, our website on Facebook? <laughs> Resurrection of Jake the Snake, isn't yeah, it? You should look it up on Facebook. Yeah. Resurrection of Jake the Snake, or uh, if you go to, um, what about Twitter? Uh, should be... God, dude, come on, you know I don't remember this <laughs> shit. <laughs> Scott, Chris, Chris, where are we at? Backup producer. Uh, Facebook is Resurrection of Jake the Snake. Resurrection of Jake the Snake, Facebook. Twitter. Jake the Snake movie. Oh, yep. Jake the Snake movie. Jake's, Jake the Snake? Movie, yeah. Jake the Snake movie. Hashtag, is it Jake that the snake movie. Is, it, is it Twitter thing? Jake the Snake movie? <laughs> <laughs> There's too many Twitter handles, uncle! This is the clip that's going on YouTube right here. <laughs> Hashtag Jake the Snake movie. Go tell your friends. Spread the word. Give a hand to these guys in the big time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Slam Dance. Thank you, Arc Life. My boys, Adam Copeland Edge, come on up here for the longest shot with all of us, RVD. My boy, Johnny Nelson, come on up here. Danny Trejo, Howard Fine, Cam Moline.